They're bound. They're in chains. And let me just give you this picture. When a person offers themselves to sin, they're really offering themselves to Satan. And they're saying, go ahead. Put on the chains and I will be your slave. And Paul tells us that most men actually understand this down deep. I love the message paraphrase of Romans 6 and verse 16. Remember, this is a paraphrase today. Let me read it to you. It says, you know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. And so many people believe that they're living their lives out there in the world and, they're, and that they're actually free. They say, I'm free to do whatever I want. I'll sleep with whoever I want. I'll act the way I want. I'll cuss as much as I want. I'll steal as much as I want. I'll do whatever I want. How many of you realize they're not actually free? The truth of the matter is that the enemy has put chains on them and that they're actually bound in the spiritual world. And let me tell you something. When Satan binds you up, he will pull you down all the way down to the bottom. He is a deceiving liar who'll tell you that, offer you freedom and tell you that you're free. Tell them you that you're enjoying these things. But the truth is that, they, that, that those people are bound. And I wonder what would happen if the Lord Jesus Christ would somehow anoint our eyes with eye salve so that we can actually see the spiritual bondage that is in people that are around us. If we could see the fetters that they have on them and we could see the change, and we, we, I think it would be amazing for us. But let me tell you something. I've got really good news today. Come on. Jesus Christ came to release us from the prison. Amen? He came to release us from the chains. Amen? You don't have to leave this church today bound. You can leave to this church today free in the name of Jesus. And you might walk in here and say, I wonder why these people are so happy. Why do they get so excited about praise and worship? Why do they get so excited at the mention of the name of Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because the, this uh, Peter's story is our story. You see, we too were bound. Come on. We too were in darkness. But one day, the Lord Jesus Christ set us free. Come on. Give, your, give the Lord a big hand of praise today. Jesus describes his ministry and his life in Luke chapter 4, and verse 18. This is what he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And I love the next phrase. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Come on. Freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. I'm just here today to tell you that freedom is your right as a believer. Amen. You don't have to live your life in bondage. You can be free because whom the sun sets free is free indeed i love acts 12 and verse number seven and it simply says and the chains fell off peter's wrist come on how many of you realize that if god can take physical chains and knock them off of somebody's wrist then let me tell you something that demonic forces and the strongholds of the enemy can be broken in the name of jesus let me tell you why because our lord and savior jesus christ defeated defeated the enemy on Calvary. Come on. He bruised his head. Amen. He made a show of him publicly triumphing over him in it. Jesus Christ is the victor, has always been the victor, and will always be the victor. Come on. And because of that, he can set anyone free from anything. Amen. We've got to recognize that the only hope in the world is Jesus. How many of you say, I remember when my chains came off? Amen. I remember when the Lord set me free. Thank Him for that today. And then secondly, we've got to remember that God hears every prayer. God hears every prayer. Satan would try to tell you that your prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. That God doesn't listen to your prayers. That He doesn't care about your situation. And He certainly isn't going to answer them. But I want to tell you something. Let God be true and the devil a liar. Amen. I'm just here today to tell you that God hears every prayer. And just as God answered the prayers of the early church in that day, He'll answer the prayers of His church today. Just like the early church cried out to God and God answered. If we'll cry out to God, God will answer. 
And this chapter begins with a very cold and sobering reality. Herod arrested some of those who belonged to the church. He was intending to persecute them. And, and we read that the apostle James is put to death by the sword. James, before James was even buried, they went and they, and they arrested Peter. Can you imagine the intensity of the prayer that that must have caused? Imagine today, if that was happening in our congregation, Dwight and Carey had been martyred for the cause of Christ, and they'd thrown J.R. And, 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 and Steve in prison. And you imagine the prayer meeting that we would have around here. Come on. The intensity was real. You know, they were saying to themselves, who's going to be next? What's going to happen? Herod would have had Peter killed immediately, but the Scripture tells us that the Jewish calendar of all things got in the way. How many of you know that the Lord's in control of everything? Amen. It was Passover week that week, a big holiday, and, and Herod knew that to do such a thing during Passover week would not please the Jews, and so he thought, well, I'll just keep him in prison, and you know, when Passover week is done, we'll do away with Peter, just like we did away with, with James. And uh, so the, the, the church had a decision to make, didn't they? Peter was in prison. They had to decide, what are we going to do? Yeah, you know, are we going to just give up and give in? Are we going to are we going to just start preparations for Peter's funeral? What are we going to do? They just said, "No, we're going to pray. We're going to trust the Lord. We're going to have a prayer meeting." Amen. I remember one time a few years ago, we were having a prayer meeting here, and and uh, one of the brothers came in. His name was Raul Ortiz. I don't know if I remember Brother Raul, and he said, "I came to pick a fight." Come on. In other words, he said, "I came to I came to fight the enemy tonight by my prayers." Amen. I believe that God hears us. And let me tell you, a lot of believers, have, when it comes to praying for their family to be saved, sometimes it's easy for us to give up and give in. We say, well, that's just the way they are. They'll never change. They've always been that way. There's nothing I can do. Let me tell you something. Don't believe those lies of the enemy. You can pray, my friend. You can believe the Lord. And so the scripture tells us that they called a corporate prayer meeting where people cried out to God. By the way, we have a corporate prayer meeting here on Friday at 9 o'clock p.m. You're invited. You're welcome to come. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 tells us this. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was kind of praying for them. No, no, no. They were earnestly praying for, to God for him. They were earnest. In other words, they were serious about it. Uh, we've got to get back to having an earnestness about the things of God. It was a wrestling. Uh, it was a crying out. It was a continual stream of intercession that went up to heaven for Peter. Every evening as the Passover week dragged on, you could see clusters of Christians scurrying through the shadows toward homes all over Jerusalem. They would stay there until the wee hours of the morning, and their prayers sounded like this, Oh God, spare Peter's life. We've already lost James, and, and we will lose Peter too, God, unless you intervene. Our eyes are upon you. You are our only hope. We know that they couldn't get physically close to Peter go to Peter's cell to encourage him or to give him a verse or to lay hands upon him. But let me tell you the good news. What is unreachable physically is still accessible spiritually. Come on. You may think to yourself, though, there's nothing I can do. I, I don't know. I would love to see my son and daughter serving the Lord. I, I would love to see my family coming in and, and being a part of a church somewhere. Let me tell you, let me remind you that prayer moves the hand of God. And that hand, my friend, is omnipotent. That means all-powerful. He, he, he is omniscient. He knows exactly what to do. I love 2 Samuel 14 and verse 14. One of the most powerful scriptures, I think, that's in the Word. You can write it down. 2 Samuel 14, 14. It says this, God devises means so that His banished ones are not expelled from Him. God devises the means to bring the ones who've been banished, the ones who've been sent away, the ones who are far away. God's the one who devises the means to bring them back. You know what that tells us? That God knows the exact set of circumstances that your loved one needs that they will surrender to 
Christ if these things happen in their life. God knows the exact thing that needs to happen. That God knows the exact person that they need to meet. God knows the exact radio station they need to listen to. God knows exactly what needs to happen. And the scripture says that he devises the means. In other words, my friend, he controls what happens in that person's life until they surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that, you ought to be shouting the praise unto God because there's nothing impossible with the Lord. Prayer makes a difference. The year was 1977. The heat in New York City that year was tremendous, I understand. Fear had gripped those in the Big Apple. A man who was soon to become known as the son of Sam or the 44 caliper killer was wreaking havoc on the city. The young man doing this was a crazed killer. He would kill and then write letters to the newspaper about his homicidal spree. And the word on the street was that he targeted brunettes. I guess New York City never had so many blondes and redheads. But from the affluent Upper East Side to Skid Row, it was the topic of conversation. After 13 months, the case finally broke. David Berkowitz, a 24-year-old poster worker living in Yonkers, was arrested, and for months his picture appeared on the news. He had a crazed look in his eye and a smirk on his face. He openly pleaded to killing five women and one man and wounding many others. His prison sentence was in the 100s of years. and He was eventually sent off to Attica where the world somewhat forgot about him. David's life had been difficult from the beginning. He was an adopted child in a Jewish home. Gave his parents a lot of grief. And he said this by his own testimony. He said, I felt somehow drawn to evil and occultic things. I, I was fascinated by it. In fact, it seemed that even as a child, I was marked and cultivated by Satan for evil purposes. He loved horror movies. David joined the army. When he got out, he just wanted to live a normal kind of a life. But his soul and his life was empty and he was bored. And so he joined a satanic group then where he found a certain degree of acceptance. And that group was bent on creating mayhem. And, and David began doing things like toxing rocks off of bridges just to see the accidents. He set over 2,000 fires. He prayed to demons and felt like uh, he, he was losing his mind and in and, and, and then finally, after being incarcerated in 1987, David was moved to Sullivan Correctional Facility. On a cold December night, while walking in the exercise yard, he was approached by a young prisoner by the name of Ricky Lopez. Ricky had been praying for the son of Sam. And Ricky boldly told him that Jesus Christ loved him, died on the cross for him, and had a purpose for his life. David told him he didn't know who he was talking to, that there was no way that God could ever love a person who had done as many wrong things in his life as he had. But Ricky just kept walking beside him every single day, praying for him, telling him of God's love. Later, he gave him a New Testament in Psalms. And since he was Jewish, Ricky told him to start reading in the Psalms. And the Word began to penetrate his heart. Finally, David Berkowitz found Psalms 34 and verse number 6, and it touched and penetrated his heart. And the scripture says this, this poor man called, and the Lord heard him, and he saved him out of all of his troubles. He came to an understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ was. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ saved him. You say, that's a pretty amazing story, Pastor Bob. How do you know it's true? I just believe it's true. Come on. Because God's not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. Come on. God broke the chains. The years of hardness and mental sickness and perversion were swept away as all he did was read the word day after day after day. I understand he became the chaplain's assistant at Sullivan and often preached in the chapel services. That's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? Can we just give the Lord a hand for that? If God can save the son of Sam... If God can save someone like David Berkowitz because a young man by the name of Ricky Lopez had the audacity to believe 
receive the Lord for him. Let me ask you something. How daring and how audacious are you in your prayer life? Maybe your prayer life's non-existent. Maybe you rarely, if ever, pray for your family. Let me tell you something. God brought you here to this service to stir you up, to tell you that nothing is impossible, to cause you to lay on your bed at night and say, God, I believe in you. Devise the means that are necessary. Do whatever you can do to bring it to pass. 